Fire is an essential part of all the ecosystems here in the U.S. and throughout the world. But one of the biggest issues is landowners have is getting fire back on their property. And I'm trying to do that. Again, concerns about liability, about risk, and things like that have always been a big concern for private landowners. So one of the ways that we've found, and probably the best way that we've found to get fire back on the ground and to get private landowners burning is through the use of prescribed burn associations. Me, that's a group of landowners with a common interest to put fire on the landscape working together to maximize their resources. It's neighbors helping neighbors, pooling resources to get the job done to improve our rangelands in an effective, safe manner. The biggest one is they're scared of it getting away and the liability involved with it. People are reluctant to burn because uh, of various reasons, including being just scared. They're scared of the fire, of escapes, and they don't have the knowledge and the ability to burn or the resources. One's a sociological barrier. I mean, fire has always been portrayed as, as big and evil and dangerous, and, and quite frankly, I think a lot of folks are scared of it, and they don't realize that under prescribed conditions, you can fairly well predict what your fire is going to do, and, and it's fairly safe practice. I think some of the barriers that people have are limitations of personnel, resources, equipment, the skill base, the knowledge, and their fear of fire, their general fear of fire because of lack of education about it and how to apply it to the land effectively. first thing that it does is get some people out there actually see fire on the landscape, see a fire that's been intentionally lit under a prescribed set of conditions and it behaves like it's supposed to and at the end of the day there's no or minimal escape. The smoke clears, it's burned like it was supposed to be burned, nobody's hurt and two or three times when you experience that all of a sudden you're one of fire's biggest proponents. So as you get a group of people together to burn, they all learn how to burn. Uh, they work with each other after while, you know, they basically decrease the chance that a fire is ever going to get away. And therefore the liability of a set of group of people that works together, in my mind, sort of disappears. Like we first started out, it, it, min it gives a landowner a place to go and a tool to use that minimizes their liability, which is what, that's what keeps people from doing it. And that's the biggest benefit that they have. The structure of the burn associations varies because it's left, kind of left up to the burn associations itself exactly how they want to run the organization. Typically they'll have a president, a vice president, a treasurer. Those I think are the three offices that they really need to have. And the bylaws are structured to where the state organization actually has a generic set of bylaws that local burn associations can adopt if they want to. They basically adopt bylaws and elect the president, the vice president, and the treasurer. And then the body of the burn association basically dictates how that burn association is run, whether they want to uh, structure it where I know some burn associations actually want to vet all the burn plans that burn association members are going to implement and there are other burn associations that don't do that. So it can, it can range from being really formal to very informal. Typically, I think they're relatively informal though. There's three key factors that we need to consider when, when starting a PBA. First and foremost, we've got to gather together a group of interested landowners. You know, identify that group of people that want to start using fire, want to start putting fire on the land, get those folks together. The next thing that's most important is we've got to pick a leader from in that group or identify a leader well before we start the meeting or get the process going. Somebody that wants to step up and just take that leadership role. And then the third final thing, and probably one of the most important things, is having someone there to help provide technical assistance and advice. This is usually somebody from a federal agency, state agency, cooperative extension, that can help this group nurture them along, help them with writing fire plans, help them with getting grant money to find stuff for equipment, for training, 
also help them to determine burn days, how to burn, do that. I just took the bylaws off the uh, OPBA website, filled in the blanks, and that's kind of how we got started rolling because really I think if you're going to be an organization, you probably ought to set your foundation first. That way you got a start point and you can start building off of that. We like for people to attend at least three prescribed burns before we will in turn go burn on their property. We want them to participate in as many uh, prescribed fires as possible and that comes in many forms. Whether it's showing up and you know carrying water around to people that need it, to being spotters, there's the hard jobs, there's the easy jobs. Everybody has a role and a function where they can fit in. We have a really good active uh, association. We have regular meetings on an annual basis, sometimes semi-annual. And one of the greatest tools to help us function is setting us up with the group me text. And we can have mass communication instantly to 70 members and everybody knows where everybody is and who's available. If a person wishes to join a prescribed burn association, they can contact uh, the state organization and they would give them the name and number of a local burn association that is close to them. The state organization has a website that has all of that local burn association information on the website. They would then contact probably the president of the local burn association and they would tell them when the next meeting was or send them an application. We've got small backpack sprayers, blowers, an assortment of hand tools such as shovels, rakes, spades. Usually have about six grip torches, gloves, radio vests, safety glasses. Some other stuff that we have on hand is all the manuals for all the equipment that we have that's mechanical and we have spare parts and stuff that we use those things for. We have 85 local conservation districts across the state of Oklahoma, and they're the only local unit of government that's charged with the conservation of natural resources. So about eight years ago, we started working with the prescribed burn associations to get equipment out to the to local burn associations so that we could get more fire on the ground. We have private lands biologists across the state. Uh, they're encouraged to, to meet, to present at, to, to work with their prescribed burn associations. Uh, we're a very strong proponent of fire. We use fire extensively on our wildlife management areas, and we also realize the benefits and the need for fire on, on private lands in Oklahoma. So anything that we can do to encourage that, and that includes working with those prescribed burn associations, we like to do that. The Noble Research Institute is a private organization. Noble works with burn associations do, just through support, uh, institutional support, but also uh, with our staff. We have several staff. Uh, pasture and range consultants, uh, wildlife and range consultants, and others on staff that uh, work with landowners and these prescribed burn associations. We show up to do educational events. Uh, we work with the individuals within, the, within those associations on their properties to help them develop prescribed burn plans uh, to implement prescribed fire on their property. And then in, in general education too on uh, the use of prescribed fire. Uh, in addition to that, the Noble Foundation hosts uh, prescribed burn workshops, a couple of those uh, during each year in conjunction with the Oklahoma Prescribed Burn Association, Oklahoma State University, Oklahoma Department of Life Conservation, Nature Conservancy, uh, and NRCS, and, and other agencies throughout the state as needed uh, in different areas of the state uh, to be able to promote and educate landowners about the use of prescribed fire. The local prescribed burn associations in the Partners for Fish and Wildlife Program work together as neighbors helping neighbors, but also some of those neighbors are our cooperators with the Partners for Fish and Wildlife Program, so we're able to actually get prescribed fire on our properties, our cooperators. Oklahoma NRCS works with the prescribed burn associations in a couple of different ways. At the state level, uh, we help to provide funding uh, to work with landowners on prescribed burn plans and implementation of those plans, and also work to help implement field days and other uh, outreach organizations. Oklahoma NRCS provides funding out of our local budget, uh, working with the prescribed burn association on their regional coordinators uh, that work directly with landowners and the local uh, prescribed burn associations. 
it does a number of things. It gets rid of all the wildfire potential, cleans out all that undergrowth that you don't want in an area, gets rid of all your cedar trees. You know, it's, it's good for wildlife and it's good for human habitat as well. It builds a community of neighbors helping neighbors, the camaraderie, and just knowing that somebody's out there that has your back. One thing I do stress when I'm talking to people that may have a negative attitude is, uh, you know, this may save your, your pasture or your, even more importantly, your home or barns. Because everywhere we burn gives a fire department the upper hand or at least a better chance to divert that fire. And I said, if nothing else, if you don't want your place burnt, let your neighbors do it. And because it may save you, and you can, I think when you see the benefits of it, you're probably gonna to wanna to be a member. I think that prescribed burn associations play a very big part of uh, the future of prescribed burning. From a ecological landscape perspective, there's no way that resource management professionals can implement enough burns on the landscape to actually achieve what we need to achieve across the landscape. The only way that we can do that is by empowering private landowners to conduct prescribed burns on their own and teaching them why they need to do it, how they need to do it, and getting that accomplished. I think that without the prescribed burn associations, prescribed fire is just, it's strictly hit and miss. I mean, it's a landowner that's big enough to have the resources um, to be able to burn. It enables some of the smaller landowners that otherwise wouldn't be able to burn or wouldn't be able to burn near as often as they need to. It enables them to burn it. It's very beneficial in, in getting more fire on the landscape that, that's historically fire driven. Prescribed burn associations are critical for the future of fire and, and, and you can tell by the, the number of burn plans and burns that are occurring year after year. It keeps increasing with more and more prescribed burn associations coming in. So the, the knowledge of the associations is being spread, which results in more fires. Having an organized setting like that, an organized group that you know is going to come out and do the job safely and effectively with a prescribed burn plan, uh, the proper personnel, the proper equipment, is all very important to pull it off. And I think that's going to be essential for all people in the future.